leptin is a hormone and it drives sugar from inside your bloodstream into the cells where the body actually utilizes it as principal fuel. When insulin is not able to do its job properly, either because there's not enough insulin or there's enough insulin, but it, it, there's resistance to that insulin at the, at the cell level where it does its job, whether it's in the liver or in, inside other cells, that resistance or insulin resistance is associated with an increased level of blood sugar. We call that diabetes. That's what diabetes is essentially, an increased resistance to insulin. It's increased resistance to insulin, not deficiency of insulin. Because the average type 2 diabetic, the adult onset diabetic, that makes up 95% of the diabetics in our society, actually make more, not less insulin. It's just the insulin can't do its job because of resistance. Now, the drugs that are used to treat diabetes or insulin resistance do not reduce insulin resistance. They're not effective at resolving the fundamental problem there. But what is effective at reducing insulin resistance appears to be fasting. A health-promoting diet and exercise following fasting combined together is the most powerful tool we've seen at helping people normalize their blood sugar and create an internal environment where they can sustain normal blood sugars and in a large percentage of cases without the ongoing need for medication. Another mechanism by which fasting may have a profound effect on the body is dealing with a problem that's often referred as gut leakage. Now a human being has a tunnel that goes through their body. That tunnel starts in the mouth, it goes down the throat, and into the esophagus, and then into the stomach, eventually into the three parts of the small bowel, then the large bowel, then into the uh, rectum, and then eventually people push it out through the anus at the other end. So they're shoving stuff in one end, it's going through this digestive system, and eventually they push it out the other end. But all the while, that material is in the gut. It's not technically inside your body. Now you swallowed it, you can't see it anymore, but it's technically going through your body. It's not yet in your body. It doesn't get in the body until it gets through a very, very fine mesh that is represented here by this screen. Uh, and that mesh of your intestinal mucosa is designed to filter out large molecules, big peptides, proteins, viruses, bacteria, etc. Keep that stuff from getting inside the body and allowing it to be pushed out the other end. But what would happen, just like a screen keeps moths and flies out, what would happen if that, the holes in the screen were made bigger? What if the screen got torn? What if something happened to that screen that allowed flies and bugs to get in? Well, we know what would happen in our house. What happens in our body? If something widens the screen mesh of our body, peptide molecules, protein molecules, large things can get into our bloodstream, and they has to be dealt with. And the way that the body deals with those invaders is with our immune system, and it's well equipped to handle certain infiltrations. However, in genetically vulnerable people, if this process of gut leakage, that is leaking in things into the body that's not supposed to be there, is excessive, in those genetically vulnerable people, the immune system, for reasons that we're still trying to understand, goes awry. It stops working properly. And if the part of the immune system starts uh, overreacting to these foreign invaders, it may begin to react to our body tissue itself as a foreign tissue. For example, in ulcerative colitis, it's actually the immune system of the body that's generating the inflammation associated with the bleeding and mucus and lesions that are associated with this condition. In arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis, it's actually your immune system and components of your immune system that are beginning to destroy your collagen tissue because it's confused and thinks your collagen tissue is a foreign invader. In the case of asthma, it might be your lungs that are involved. In vasculitis or dermatitis or psoriasis, it may be the skin that's involved. In other, you know, there's many of these itis type conditions or inflammatory conditions where the body's immune system begins to react to its own tissue. We call these autoimmune diseases or diseases where your body's immune system has been thrown off. And one of the things that's thought to throw this off is gut leakage. 
the absorption of peptide molecules triggering immune responses that were, are incapable of effectively handling. The medical management of these autoimmune diseases it centers around the use of drugs to suppress the overreactive autoimmune response, in other words, to calm the immune system down. The problem with those medications, although they can appear like miracles when they're first used, medications like prednisone or, or some of the anti-cancer drugs like methotrexate, is that their long-term use has devastating and often deadly consequences. And so the, a better solution than trying to suppress the immune system is figuring out how to stop the gut leakage that tends to excite this condition in vulnerable people. So what might be causing the screen of our intestinal tract to become damaged or open or it's inflammation. Something's inflaming the intestinal mucosa. It's one of the things that can cause inflammation are free radicals, reactive mol uh, molecules that can damage tissue. What's a good source of free radicals that might be damaging the intestinal mucosa of humans? Well, one really valuable source of free radicals would be smoking cigarettes. It turns out cigarette smokers are exposed to massive amounts of free radicals. For example, have, if you look at people that smoke for long periods of time, they often get these very characteristic wrinkles around their face, this premature puckering, call it like smoker's face. It's when you look at somebody, you can almost tell, even not knowing anything about them, they've probably been a, a big smoker because they got that prune-like appearance that their face, because that is collagen tissue being damaged with cross-linkaging secondary to free radicals. And it's not just their faces that are being affected by cigarettes, but tissues throughout their body, including the animal lighting of their blood vessels, which allows um, sores to form that are associated later with atherosclerosis and plaques and clots and heart attacks and strokes, which is probably one of the reasons why smokers are at much higher risk for some of these other conditions. The free radicals from smoking damages the body. What are other sources of free radicals? Well, for example, the digestion of alcohol. The peroxidation of alcohol yields a lot of free radicals. And so drinking alcohol uh, uh, on a regular basis may be associated with this kind of damage. The use of high uh, fat, particularly high temperature uh, heated fats, like you would get when you eat um, the flesh of animals after you kill them. Um, when that's cooked at high temperature, you yield a lot of free radicals. So that's why people that are on high animal fat, high animal protein diets, may have so much substantially increased risk of many of these diseases. Uh, heated oils, particularly fried foods cooked at high temperature, also an excellent source of high dose free radicals. So if you want to get a lot of free radicals and get the premature wrinkling and increase your risk of dying slowly from these various conditions or rapidly from the consequences of these conditions, a good thing to do would be to smoke, drink alcohol, and eat greasy, fatty, slimy, dead, decaying flesh foods and lots of heated fats and oils. On the other hand, if you'd like to avoid this type of vulnerability to gut leakage, we want to avoid the products that tend to cause the free radical formation. And at the same time, you can choose to avoid foods that lend themselves to gut leakage. It turns out there are some foods that in the inflamed gut cause more problems than others. For example, dairy products. The proteins associated with milk, cheese, yogurt, and products that contain these products are much more reactive uh, clinically than some other proteins. So avoiding dairy products can be very helpful for people to have these autoimmune type responses. Glutinous grains, particularly wheat, rye, and barley, when processed into flour products, often are aggravating for people that have these particular vulnerabilities. And so in those patients, we tend to avoid those types of food products. A way to get the gut that's already inflamed to heal can be associated with therapeutic water-only fasting. It turns out in fasting, if we measure the acute phase reactive proteins that are a monitor of this type of inflammatory process, those acute phase reactive proteins begin to normalize. The inflammation begins to go down and people begin to heal. If you can fast a person long enough to heal the gut and then avoid introducing those proteins that, or those food factors that cause inflammation or lend to gut leakage, you can manage the conditions associated with autoimmune disease. That's why we see patients with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis that are told that diet has nothing to do with their condition. There's nothing they can do. Nobody gets well. It's just about taking these drugs until the consequences occur. We find very different experiences. These people with these problems often get dramatic improvement. And to the degree that they stick to a health-promoting diet and lifestyle, they can often manage and maintain their condition um, it, for years or decades. The body is controlled by a nervous system, and that nervous system has two components. 
That nervous system of control is referred to as the autonomic nervous system. It does the parts of things that you don't have to think about, like making your heart beat or regulating uh, functions, whether it be peristalsis or visual dilation, etc. Things that you don't have to think about telling your body to do, it does it automatically. And it's regulated by this autonomic nervous system. And the two components of the autonomic nervous system include the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And they're in balance with each other. And it's important that they be in good balance. If they get out of balance, you can get certain symptoms. For example, if your sympathetic nervous system's tone is set too high, you might have symptoms like diarrhea or loose stools. If your parasympathetic tone was set too high, you might have constipation. The, the idea is that this nervous system needs to be in balance. And when the nervous system gets out of balance and we have symptoms, we try to figure out ways to get the nervous system back in balance. And we've discovered literally hundreds of healing systems which work more or less effectively at getting the autonomic nervous system back in balance. And in fact, autonomic normalization may be the mechanism by which many of these common healing techniques actually work. For example, chiropractic manipulation, osteopathic manipulation, massage theory, therapy, biofeedback and yoga, relaxation techniques, um, homeopathy and acupuncture, many, many healing conditions that are commonly utilized all work to more or less effective result at helping rebalance the autonomic nervous system and helping ameliorate some of the symptoms that are associated with this imbalance. Well, one thing that has a profound effect on the autonomic nervous system is a period of fasting. Fasting is almost like rebooting a hard drive on a computer. If you take a computer and you turn it, shut it off, and you reboot it, it's amazing how many things kind of kind of clear themselves out when there's been some corruption or some problems in on operating function. Many times that's all you have to do is reboot the system. Well, that's what fasting acts like in human beings. It's like rebooting the system, setting it back to baseline. Psychospiritual impact. Um, there are few religious traditions that don't have um, a history and tradition associated with fasting. Most religions recognize the profound effect a period of fasting can have, both on physical, uh, psychological, and certainly uh, in, in spiritual realms. Although many people think if you don't eat that that will compromise your immune system's ability to heal itself, it turns out that some of the immune system's enhancements, for example, helper killer or T cell activity, etc., are actually found to be enhanced during the fasting process. And many things that seem to be chronic, annoying problems that don't seem to heal, once people begin fasting, oftentimes heal rapidly. So actually we see fasting, at least in many respects, to be an enhancement, not a deterrent to the body's ability to heal itself. 